Hi guys. It's great Hello. to see everyone. Hello. It's, Hi William. It's wonderful to see everyone. Happy birthday, William. Thank you. <laughs> Turning 21 again. Turning 21 again. Amazing. <laughs> I had my 21st birthday for I think the third time. Um, last <laughs> Good. Excellent. <laughs> Enjoying your day? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been, it's, it's a little overcast. I think the winter vortex is down here too. So it's unseasonally, but it's actually nice. It's the south, so yeah. Still in Baton Rouge. Yeah, I'm still in Baton oh. Rouge. Uh, oh, wow. So yeah, I'm still in the south. Uh, yeah, where are you guys? Um, I, I drove to Bethesda last oh, week. Oh my God. 18 hours. Yeah. Oh Great. my God. With two kids. Yeah. I know. Oh, Chris. Yikes. <laughs> I didn't actually do all, I only drove like four hours of the 18, but I was, I was shotgun. I was keeping Did the kids, the did the rest of the driving? The kids were amazing. <laughs> actually, I was, I was pretty blown away at how amazing they were. They, they, you know, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old normally can't make it for like a 45 yeah. minute to the trip to the market and back. But yeah. apparently 18 hours when they know they're, when they know they're going to be in it for the long haul, they, they yeah. just rallied. It was amazing. Get on them. Get on them. Yeah. And they weren't watching like shows the whole time. Wow. They maybe watched one movie each maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was a lot of like drawing, reading, oh, staring out the window. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Car games. Car games, yep, we have some car games. We do yeah. those and sing. We're like big, we're, we love singing. We're like a big yeah. singing family. So we did that, which is great. And traps. Yeah, we exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. It was good. It was good. And Judy, where are you? I'm in Santa Fe. Ooh. And you just got there, right? Yeah, I've been here almost a month. I got here on the 11th night. And uh, yeah, so it's almost a month. And before that, you were in Kutch? Yes, yeah. Excellent. Different weather in Santa Fe now than probably Kutch. When oh, you yeah, it was 104 when I left. And, oh, wow. And so, and I had to pack a 50-pound bag, and I packed all things for hot weather because yeah. I couldn't think otherwise. <laughs> so I've been wearing the same things all together since I've been here. <laughs> the layered look is, is always in style. Yeah, right. Who's looking? The there question. you go. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, how are you? I'm good. It's lovely to see everybody and meet Judy. Uh, I'm calling in from Portland, Maine. Excellent. Where we, where we saw snow this morning. So, wow. Yeah. There's no in May. I know. Yeah, it's like walking by all the beautiful flowers that had just bloomed. <laughs> it's like, hang in there, guys. I know. <laughs> That's always tough. I what know. are you guys drinking? William, you always have interesting tea to drink. What are you drinking? I try to switch it up. Um, you can't really see it, but I'm drinking. Um, well, this is one of the old cups I have. But I'm drinking a, uh, a continuation with a Puar sort of kick from last mm -hmm. week. Uh, this is a Last time it was a ripe puar, so more fermented. This is a raw puar, so less fermented. So it still has some of that green sort of tea flavor mm. uh, instead of a very sort of earthy sort of puar flavor. No chrysanthemum, just sort of pure puar. Mm. Ooh, wonderful. Excellent. Puar is so good. How about, how about you ladies? Diana, what are you drinking? I have a little um, lavender chamomile situation going on here. Nice. In a mug that I bought in Tokyo ages and ages ago. That's got this little thumbprint that I adore. Nice. Oh, that's fabulous. It's ceramic. It's stoneware or porcelain? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, it looks like some sort of leaf applied. Um, it's got a little ombre situation. It's really mm. Very nice. nice. Very nice. Thank you. I also have a nice mug. I actually didn't pour my tea because I wanted to show you this mug because I thought it was such mm. a cool mug. It's made by an artist named Clary Illion who's based in Eli, Iowa, mm. and I just, I love the foot. Look how smooth that foot is. Isn't that amazing? Nice. And the color yeah. of the stoneware is yeah. that beautiful sort of kind of yummy brown stoneware color. And it's got this great Tomoku glaze that kind of breaks orange. You can see all, oh yeah. Isn't that great? 
So I'm going to drink, I'm drinking some, now that I'm home, I've got good tea. <laughs> Not that I didn't have good tea before, but it's nice. I'm drinking some Ten Ren Black Rose tea. Mm. Um, so I'll pour it now so that I don't pour tea all over my computer. How about you, Judy? What are you drinking? I am drinking in a very plain cup, Tibetan everyday tea, mm. uh, which I get from my Tibetan clinic in Ahmedabad. I did. Now I think uh, I, I've been searching online. I can't find it, but it's a medicinal tea. It's, it gives you an energy and it's really nice and I've gotten so used to it. Mm. And the mm. actual name of it is Rob Guy Yangsin tea, but mm. the short form what is it, everyday tea. What's in it? It has herbs or is it a green or a black tea? It's a green tea, it's herbs, yeah. Mm. Fabulous. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Well, I'm so excited to talk about I'm not going to say, I was going to say craftsmanship, but then I had to correct myself. Craftspersonship. Um, oh. They're craft. <laughs> right. To craft <laughs> with all of you today. Um, makers. And, what? Makers. Makers. Exactly. Making. Exactly. Um, I was thinking, actually, when I was thinking about this topic, I was remembering uh, Richard Sennett's book about craftsmen. And one of the things he says, there he has this sort of beautiful chapter that talks about the hand and the eye and the relationship between the hand and the eye. And then also one of the, the criteria he has for being a true master craftsperson is that if you do something 10,000 times, which mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. <laughs> to think about. Um, I'm not sure I've done anything 10,000 times. No, I'm um, trying to think that that makes me a master of very little, but... <laughs> Eating. <laughs> eating. So I'm a master eater. Um, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm just kind of want to turn it over to Diana and Judy to, to, you have some sort of show and tell objects or some, some thoughts for us. I like this topic. Okay. And um, one thing I want to start with is art and craft, which is a very old debate, right? And, you know, once I wrote something about it and someone said, you know, isn't this over? Why does it matter? And it matters because of valuation, mm -hmm. because uh, art is understood as something done by an individual. It's their intellectual property. Craft is thought of as something done by an anonymous person, probably in a third world developing country. And, um, and the valuation is very different. And I was thinking about this. We, we did a project of um, narrative art when I was at Kalaraksha in 2003. And it was interesting because it, it's not a tradition in India. And so I asked some of our participants, some of our um, master artisans, um, what they thought was the difference between art and craft. Now, I didn't have a word in Gujarati for craft, so I used the word craftsmanship, karigari, mm -hmm. right? So I said, what is the difference between kala, art, and karigari? So Ishmael Bai said, it's the difference between imagination and execution, okay? And Ali Mamadisha said, art is what you do the first time, and craftsmanship is what you do thereafter. And Lachuben, who's a Rabari embroiderer, she said, everybody can do craft, but not everybody can do art. Okay, so I, you know, that's pretty much how we expect the, the distinction to be made. But then I started asking some of our artisan students or graduates. And one person, Zubair, said to me, uh, art exists, craftsmanship is what we do with it. Mm. Which is completely like, whoa, it blew me away. Like, oh that's like almost the opposite and uh but then later i found out that i asked another group of students uh do you think art is important in our <clears> life and they said yes because without art we wouldn't be here and i realized that when by art they were meaning their tradition right it is the sort of absolute the given absolute and karigari craftsmanship is what you as a person add to it so it's a kind of a different take on it. And I'm going to go with that. That's the, the, the definition I want to go with. It's interesting too. I mean, one of the things that, that I often think about is that it's the, the distinction 
maybe about acquisition or about how one is learning these things. And this is, Diana, I'd actually be really interested in your perspective on this because I think you might have a different, um, that brings something else to it um, in thinking about Haystack. But, you know, for me, I always, I often think of craft as, you know, so as art, as the, the kinds of skills, the kinds of making skills that one acquires through going to school, going to an art school, um, that you sort of acquire it through a classroom situation or through, um, you know, sort of an, an art pedagogy that's um, performed in a, a kind of more formal a learning environment, whereas craft, um, at least the way I see in, in terms of the objects, seems to be a more about the traditions of making, sometimes passed on through generations, um, sort of indigenous um, making practices, irrespective of where you are in the world, um, or whether you're in a, you know, sort of a, um, an impoverished community or, um, or a wealthy one. But there, that, the sort of that connection to lineage, right? The connection to a tradition is something that I so often think of as connected to craftsmanship or to a craft. Um, Doing it 10,000 times. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Doing it 10,000 times or yeah. learning, right? Learning to do it from um, either in, in some cases, I suppose an apprenticeship, which wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. be connected to your family, um, but, um, or from a kind of family uh, tradition. And that was what I was going to say is there are instances, I think, where that learning is extremely codified, which is, say, an apprenticeship or, say, um, in instances where you are working very directly on a very specific set of skills that you're learning in a very particular set of ways from a particular person. Um, and I wonder, too, if the distinction isn't also sort of something that you're learning for a vocation versus something that you're learning mm -hmm. um, for, for fun or mm -hmm. for a pastime. Um, because I think, I think that craft has maybe taken on some of that valence of, of a thing that, um, that you do, that you do to pass the time or that one does, um, I don't know, sort of not, um, that, that there's, there's, there are differences there and like teasing that out is interesting. And one of the interesting things about um, this project that Kristen alluded to that, um, that I worked on about the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, this mm -hmm. um, institution up here in Maine that was founded in the 50s and 60s, is they were always trying to skirt that line of, of having both professionals and mm -hmm. amateurs. Um, right. And it's a really tough road to hoe to get kind of both of those communities mm -hmm. happy and, um, and feeling represented and um, like their space for them in one place. Um, but it's something that they were were and are kind of able to do with a fair degree of success, which is which is difficult. Well, I mean, this is also very interesting since you brought it up. Do you think about this the introduction of professionalization versus amateur, right? Do you think about um, what would be considered an amateur craftsman versus a professional craftsman? And how is that relationship sort of uh, work vis-a-vis -vis sort of defined arts and sort of an artist. Uh, and I think, I think it's different for, for the situation in India today. I would also argue that it's probably different historically too for India as well, uh, but certainly uh, in your case too, Diana. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the historical part, William, because that's something I was just thinking that I oftentimes think of these terms, art mm -hmm. versus craft, as actually discursive terms that emerged in a very particular moment in the 19th century, yeah. were sort of part of an, the arts and crafts movement as a way mm -hmm. to distinguish between different kinds of maker and, and the valuation, Judy, that you were mentioning yeah. earlier, right? That there's sort of um, a different way of, of valuing certain kinds of practices. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, when I think historically in the case of India, and that's so interesting to hear the way that your students were mm. kind of teasing out these distinctions. Because um, so I often turn to, in my classes, I turn to Ananda Kumaraswamy's writing or to Stellar Cromwich's writing um, when they're talking about sort of craft or folk art or art. And the term that Stellar Cromwich uses is shilpa or shilpakar to refer to everything, right? To the making of anything, any object that's, that's fashioned with one's hands. Um, mm is sort of falls under that category and Kumar Swami picks up on similar kinds of language. So it's interesting to think also how the, the English terms arts and craft have, have um, become perhaps 
um, solidified over time and then um, and then maybe not at moments historically, um, but also in the case of India that 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 term Shilpa didn't seem to have any traction or wasn't part of the language you were using in talking to your students, but there were other kinds of terms that were being used to distinguish these yeah. practices. And certainly they, I mean, they have ideas themselves about what they do. And I, I also wanted to say that I find the word for artisan, I use the word artisan because it's non-gendered, right? Um, or craftsperson. Uh, is karigar. And I find it problematic because it, it really, it means someone who does, someone who makes, and now it's been construed to mean a worker, which again goes back to that valuation issue, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, and and um, yeah, it's, it's often used to, to uh, yeah, keep people's social status low. Mm -hmm. The gender point is a really good one too, because that's mm -hmm. also something that I find historically when I look at, you know, craft or making traditions in South Asia, is that the only crafts people that are being documented, certainly in colonial accounts, are men, are the professional male makers, and so you know, out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> so none of those, none yeah. of the female, you know, none of the embroiderers, certainly none of the, the embroidery work that you've done for decades, that, that wasn't documented by the British because those were not professional embroiderers, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, so I think but that... I, well, uh -huh. no, no, just very quickly too, to also you know, think about going back to the concept, certainly historically, I would assume, at least this is the case in China, professional painters in the court would be considered under the category of sort of artisans or craftsmen as well, uh, you know, because they have a job and they do certain things. And those would be different from our understanding of craftsmen, let's say sort of some, someone who was lower in the socioeconomic class. I want to say also that when artisans are talking about it, they use the word karigar in a totally different way. When they, um, because like, the, the, if you go back to that idea that art exists, and the artisan craftsperson, the craftsmanship is adding something of yourself. So when they're talking, if they pick up a piece that's exceptionally good, they'll say, he was a karigar. Mm. He was an artisan, meaning mm. he added something of himself. And, that, and mm -hmm. it's a totally different right. use yeah. of the word, a totally different yeah. valuation um, within right. their community. Right. So the piece that I want to show for craftsmanship is a large wall hanging it like uh you know floor to ceiling almost uh, by Khalid by usman katri who is an ajrak printer and he put ajrak around a traditional pattern of ajrak around the border to establish who he was and his oftentimes artisans will do this they want if they're going to do something new they want to make sure that you know they can do the tradition too so that anything that looks like a mistake, you'll know it's not, it's intentional, right? So that he framed his work. He made this after he took a year long course in design education at Somaya Kalavidya. Um, and he wanted to express his experience of design education. Now, you know, he's a block printer. And a lot of this is hand painted and it's mm. taken the form, I'm sure Kristen, this will be very familiar to you, this tree of life, which is part of the Kalamkari hand painting tradition of South India. And he did get a little bit of flack from his fellow artisans about it. They said, this isn't like Kutch, this isn't like Ajrak. He said, I needed a form to express what I wanted to express. So that was his own justification, enough for him. So, um, I want to say one more thing about craftsmanship. I think that the importance of craftsmanship, you, when you know what the craft is, what, uh, what its challenges are, what its limitations are, then you can establish where someone has done something excellent or, ex or added something of himself. And um, when, like, we had one, I'm, I'm do a little diversion. Uh, we had a block print student last year who, mm. when he was saying why he wanted to take a course in design, he said, 
I've been printing all my life. I've never made a corner. Now, most people wouldn't have any idea what he's talking about, but in Adra printing, you can, corners are difficult because you want them to, like if you look in this piece, on the lower right, the corner is very good. On the lower left, uh, not as good because you can see a seam, right? And on the upper right, uh, sorry, upper left, it's good. Upper right, not as good. So he, he wanted to do some craftsmanship. He wanted to push the limits of that tradition, okay? So I think, you know, that, that is a problem when you're also valuing craft. When the viewer doesn't share that way of evaluation, it's very hard to establish value. Okay, so in this piece, he is showing his year of design education. Each of the branches, I'm gonna zoom in in a minute, um, is one of the courses. It's a six course course, a six, six two week courses. So the first one is color, that's the bottom. He's showing color there. He's written it very small. And I also wanna point out that he signed this piece, which is, I think that's important because he wanted to be known uh, as, uh, as an artist, right? Okay, and um, let me zoom in now. Okay, so there you can see color sort of uh, above those uh, discs at the bottom, which is a very common part of the Tree of Life. He must have seen some examples, okay. And then he has on the right basic design, then he has on the left mm -hmm. market orientation, then going up on the right concept, and oops uh collection and presentation presentation is in the trunk of the tree now what i really liked that he did in this piece was that in his course he created some innovations books they're not they are of the object tradition but they're new so they that's that's what we all hope the students will do innovate within the tradition and if you see on the right there's one that sort of looks like a scissors and then above that there's this half circle one that has uh three lines and then at the top there is it's actually three impressions of the same block it's a, a sort of a mm. what shape would we call that almond shape right which actually is a date shape in their in their um, vocabulary okay and those other ones are traditional. Yeah, those, those last three are traditional. Oh, wait, the one in the middle of the two almond shapes crossing, that's a new one he made. So uh, I also want to say that Khalid, um, being an artisan, he wants to have maximum utility. So he likes to work with small blocks that you can uh, arrange in all different kinds of patterns to create a, a, a composition. And that's very labor intensive. It also requires craftsmanship because um, when you do a straight block printing, you're registering the, the corners of the block, right? It's pretty straightforward. But when you do this, you have to use your judgment. You have to use your eye. And he would do uh, some compositions again and again until they got it perfect. That's how he understands craftsmanship, what he puts of himself into it. Okay, any questions? <laughs> I think this is so cool. You know, one of the things I just wanna point out that I love, and Judy, please correct me if I'm wrong in thinking about this, but am I correct in noting that the, the floral forms, one of the ways in which Khalid got those floral forms is by masking or covering the ground and then printing? No, he hand painted. So he, but the, yeah. there's the patterns in the center, are those, those are block printed, the patterns of the flowers or right inside the floral forms um, that they, oh, they look like mean, printed, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But so um, is he then doing some masking so, the, or the, the, sh the blocks aren't shaped. Right, like right, 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 right. Although right. sometimes he does cut his blocks to the shape it, so to make it more efficient. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to point out that that to me is really quite a kind of a masterful technique um, to get 
in the in the case of that the the floral form that's right at the center top of this piece um the kind of three um petal like forms those are those are individual blocks it's a very small block okay that's just shaped like that so that's what he likes to do then he 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 wants things that have uh uh unending possibilities he loves that. He loves geometry. He understands geometry inside out, mm-hmm. which is part of his tradition, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Yes, I mean, you wouldn't, if you look at it, you wouldn't right away say it was Adrak, except for the borders, right? That's such a cool thing, the way he was, you know, talking about how establishing himself, sort of like a signature, hey, I'm an Adrak printer, So here's my border, right? And now I'm going to innovate in the center and I'm going to sort of do something that's very un in the center, but I'm I'm showing you my credentials. Hmm. I'm showing you my affiliation, my connection to this community. Exactly. And my craftsmanship that I know how to do it. Because you remember what Jackson Pollock said, that technique is only a means to expressing something because he, he was criticized for doing something that any child could have done. And he he said, you know, it's not only about technique, it's about how I use that technique, where I apply it, where I don't, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. I mean, formally, this resembles one of the artists that Kristen, you talk about, one of the contemporary female artists uh, who does, uh, I think, is a very similar type of tree of life type of motif, but on the bottom, there are sort of these bombs and grenades and their minds. Yeah, there's, I... Um, Lavanya Mani, I think it's yeah. what you're thinking of. She does, mm-hmm. and she she's sort of trained in the Kalamkari tradition. I know, and and this, you know, this particular form of the, this kind of tree of life was very popular in the 17th and 18th centuries. These were textiles that were um, exported to Europe. That were made all along the Coromandel Coast. Um, of India and were exported to England and to other other parts mm-hmm. of Europe or, or to European colonies elsewhere in Asia. Um, but yeah, these were a lot of times bed covers, big pollen pores. Um, the Victorian Albert Museum has many pretty ones. Mm-hmm. So. Now Khaled wouldn't know any of that, but mm. he must have seen one somewhere. <laughs> But it's interesting to me, those kind of dual strains of a retention of tradition and an interest in, in kind of having that be visualized and read, because one of them seems to be the, the type of material and technique, and then the other one is that kind of iconographic continuity. And there's more opportunity, it seems to me, for at least in, in the example that we're looking at here, of, of kind of innovation within those terms. I took your show until very literally, so I um, I looked across uh, my my shelves and I decided to bring um, this small basket by a Passamaquoddy maker um, named Clara Keezer, who passed away um, fairly recently within the last um, five or so years, but who was a master Passamaquoddy basket maker. So what we're looking at here is a small basket. Um, so it's ash and sweet grass. So the um, the wet hair, essentially, that you can see, this is ash. Um, and then all the braiding in here is sweet grass. And she's using aniline dyes um, to create the pink kind of striation you see here. And then this is kind of like classic Clara Keezer up here on the top. Um, you see this wonderful ribbon technique that she gets for the mm-hmm. um, these. She's really um, very well known for the this um, type of form called a strawberry basket. So this is a mm. little bit of a riff on that form. Um, but it's it's all this kind of wonderful reinvented tradition um, that is happens among the main um, Wabanaki basket makers. So this is um, when I'm talking about that. I'm talking about the Penobscot, the Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, Abenaki. Um, so a group of communities up in Maine um, for whom, like so many, um, had made utility baskets really for ages and ages um, but who in the early 20th century when Maine was experiencing its um, moment of um, vacationers kind of coming in droves um, and, and having um, people who are interested in we were talking about Bar Harbor yesterday became a real center for um, the resurgence of these types of um, these types of objects and a tradition of fancy baskets started being um, kind of mm. more 
So these were um, baskets that were made not just for utility purposes, but were being made for a tourist market. Um, so there's a resurgence um, kind of in that early 20th century moment, and there's fascinating photography around those um, those types of markets that were happening in Bar Harbor, but that were really happening um, all up and down the coast of Maine. Um, often there were communities who were going actually to resorts. So if you came to a place like Poland Springs to have your healing waters, um, uh, Native communities would come and actually kind of like do sales there for that. Um, and then it's a, it's a tradition that actually kind of um, fell to the wayside a little bit until about 15 years ago um, when the Maine Basket Makers Alliance really kind of decided that it was worthy of kind of reintroduction and um, for communities who were in and around the Indian Island area <clears throat> um, here in Maine. And so there's this really interesting um, and fairly recent sort of resurgence in interest um, in bringing these techniques to the fore, in, in many cases actually using the original wooden molds to new yeah. types of um, so there's a whole kind of, Clara Kieser is actually um, sort of the old guard, but there's um, this kind of wonderful um, young generation of Wabanaki basket makers, um, folks like Jeremy Frey, who um, are winning Best in Show at the Indian Market in Santa Fe. Um, for oh, great. Um, thinking about that kind of interesting junction of retention of traditional form, but in a like introduction of innovation. Um, so if you look at a Jeremy Frey basket, they're often asymmetrical tops. He's often, again, using these sort of traditional wooden forms, but then kind of branching off into things that feel much more sculptural. Um, and, and using, again, also like a lot of traditional techniques so um, and traditional material too. So ash and sweetgrass are kind of the basis for most of um, Wabanaki production. But, um, but these sort of really interesting riffs on, on how, how those different materials can be combined. Um, and also in an interesting way too, it's, um, it's a Kind of evolution by necessity. Um, there's this horrible emerald ash beetle um, that is decimating the um, the ash trees. Mm -hmm. in um, so so a lot of these communities um, who've had this really vibrant resurgence are really kind of facing down um, what happens if there's no ash um, and how they think about a tradition that has existed. Um, and it has been anchored, I think, like in materiality, that the sweetgrass and ash are kind of the two constants. Um, and they're thinking really interesting ways about sort of what what works and what doesn't. Um, there's there's an interesting kind of moment in the um, in the early part of the century with um, with baskets that are called Hong Kong because there's it's a type of um, I don't even know exactly what the material is, but it's it's imported um, <laughs> from Asia, and so and it's it for a while was sort of like the the, the baskets that had it weren't being taken entirely seriously um, because it was this moment when this this importation of material from from abroad was getting um, integrated in. But I think like at this moment, everyone in that community is kind of thinking um, really sort of in strategic ways about what what's going to be the the thing that takes over um, if there is a kind of inability to harvest ash the way there has been for centuries. Mm. Maybe from Hong Kong plastic or natural no, fiber? It's, uh, it's no it's a it's it was a stand-in for the sweetgrass um so it's a um, kind of thing or yeah, but it, what I was saying like some kind of a straw maybe or oh yeah okay I was just I was just thinking I was um Diana, it was so interesting when you talked about the sort of influx of tourism and how that then inspired um, makers to shift the the kinds of baskets they were producing. I mean, that seems like that's at the heart of a lot of these discussions about um, craftspersonship or about making is the market, is about, the, is about money and about whether it's um, a kind of market that's um, driving certain kinds of forms, whether it be sort of the tourist market that wants certain kinds of things, um, or a kind of a shift in patronage or new markets um, that sort of come in. Um, I've, I've sort of, I've observed some pretty fascinating shifts um, in at the International Folk Art Market. Judy, I'm sure you've observed this as well, where you have mm. um, traditional makers who are producing things 
um, not just for a uh, Western market, but for the Santa Fe market specifically. Um, and when, when sometimes those, the tradition doesn't necessarily, the tradition from their community looks quite different or um, has very different kinds of components. Yeah, but I wanna ask Diana, um, when they started producing these special baskets for tourism, they were higher value, weren't they? It totally depends. I mean, some of them, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by value. I mean, they were, mm -hmm. it, it's a tradition, it, it moved from something that was being made for utility purposes to something that was being made um, for, for presentation. Um, Right, and, and that's the definition again of craftsmanship, of adding something of yourself. Like you were talking about, you can easily mm -hmm. distinguish, it's heading toward art, right? Where they, these are signature pieces by individual recognized practitioners. But I'm, I'm asking you because I, when I went to Maine oh, so many years ago, I bought one of those baskets. It was a, very expensive, but I couldn't resist it because it was so... <laughs> Well, oh, made. It's so beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean, I I was impressed that they were able to command good prices for the for the work. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, the ones from the 1900s um, can be the early 1900s can be extremely expensive. As can um, I mean, if you're if you're looking at the at the people like Jeremy Frey who are sort of at the top of the um, at the top of the heap, sort of in terms of the market here for um, for materials here I mean yes they're 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 absolutely um very very expensive which is great yeah it, it will encourage them to, to do the best work they can do right I have a question for both speakers um to sort of think about the issue that I think it comes up in both the work is the issue of especially relationship thinking about relationship to tradition this issue of appropriation. Uh, certainly, I think in both cases that you presented, they're part of that tradition and sort of uh, cultural background. But, but certainly, I think this issue of, I think they could also be sort of accused of thinking about culturally appropriating <laughs> uh, of a certain making a tradition that is geared toward tourists or market industry. I mean, I, I want to hear your thoughts about it. I mean, I think in the case of um, of these communities who were working for the tourist market in the early 20th century, they're absolutely they're appropriating Western forms. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, you see these they're they're making purses, they're making handkerchief right. um, holders, they're making fans, right. they're making um, lamps. Like these are all objects that um, that are not they're they aren't, don't have utility in the traditional context. Right. Um, but is it, is it appropriation or is it speaking to the market, making what they perceive the market will want? Is that appropriation then? I think that's a really good point, Judy, because I often think of appropriation as such a bad word, right? It has yeah, exactly. it, there's there's little, all this baggage, but I, yeah. I think, um, but absolutely, there's ways in which um, some of these things that may, on, from one perspective, could be sort of appropriated or take ideas yeah. taken from something else are actually a way to respond to make something more marketable or to make, right. um, to continue a tradition, to keep a tradition alive um, so that there is a new market for buying. Well, because but I think, I, I mean, what, just one quick, what, I mean, I think what Judy also said is very interesting because the word appropriation came from the idea of making one's own, making something one's own, which goes back into some of these definitions, talking about, you know, the different types of craftsmen and becoming more like artisan. Yeah. But I think too, I mean, to, at the risk of sort of like, I mean, when I'm talking about Jeremy Frey sort of like elevating, I mean, it's just as appropriative, right, to understand that he's making an art object, like he yeah. understands yeah. entirely like yeah. contemporary. So he, it's the same process. It's just a different, yeah. different endpoint. Yeah. I think I don't know. I mean, yeah, appropriation. That we could do a couple of sessions just on that, <laughs> I suppose. But um, for me, it's sort of like taking without permission, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, and 
taking and misusing maybe i don't know some something that someone else is capitalizing on it yeah right yeah well, i mean Khaled did definitely way. appropriated that i don't know where he saw that tree of life but yeah. you know has nothing to do with his tradition it's everywhere but, yeah but it is everywhere yeah. brought it into his tradition yeah or his tradition into it whichever yeah Great. Well, I think we could keep talking about this for hours. I think we should probably wrap up. Um, were there any other questions, William, that you had? Or anything else pressing? No, nope. I think that was, those are great. Okay. It's just such a wonderful to hear to talk about these two very different cultural perspectives, but also very great examples of to think about craftsmanship. Um, and, and certainly I think that issue is so important um, that if we get people from other disciplines or artists themselves, they will probably have a completely different sort of take on it too, so. Absolutely. I also love that, the, that this debate of sort of thinking about art and craft, Judy, your comment in, in the beginning when you'd given a, you'd published something about this and then someone said, isn't this debate over? <laughs> I love that it's sort of never over. <laughs> keeps coming up and we keep thinking about it and keep wanting to sort of chew on it um, because there's uh, there's something compelling about the idea of of craft right of of this sort of making with one's hands um, that somehow feels different than other kinds of art objects well I mean there there is craft in art there's art in craft they really don't need to be distinguished except for the valuation yeah right Exactly. And it's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> it. yeah. And Although I do, like, I always hesitate to, to sort of, like, do a body metaphor and to suggest that, like, the craft is the hand and the art is the brain, because I don't, I absolutely don't buy into that. Um, and there is, like, there's this fetishism of the, of the tactility of a craft object that I yeah. also work against, um, and that contemporary people who I think very artists who very much understand themselves as working in the world of craft would, I think, um, also really buck against because there are a lot of them who aren't using their hands at all, who are using machines to, to create what they're making, but very much understand themselves as, as craftspeople. So my question is to throw a wrench into this debate. <laughs> <laughs> Where's digital art falls? Well, no, see, if you think of craftsmanship as the ability to add something of yourself, mm -hmm. I was thinking of that too. Like, okay, so now we're doing digital photography. Is there no craftsmanship in it? I think there is. It's, it's, it's your capability and mm. your, yeah, what you add of yourself, right? There's different levels of expertise. Well, I, I, I agree to that to a certain extent because, I, I, again, because I work with a lot of things that were not necessarily mass produced, but produced in a sort of factory setting. Then do we then exclude a whole group of objects and things that are, you know, uh, that, that do produce in a in way that are very similar and lack, shall we say, a certain type of individuality or personality. Uh, but should they be somehow value because we are coming out of we are living in sort of consumerist industrialized age that do those things somehow speak less uh of the value or the cultural sort of the culture from which they exist i think well, craftsmanship has to do with a human element mm -hmm. i don't think a machine has craftsmanship Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, maybe the person who programmed the mu uh, machine or something. Yeah. But well, what about the sewing machines, though, right, Judy? It's all a, a level of, it's a matter of degrees, well, right? Well, a sewing machine is operated by a human being, yeah. right? But human being can also For make computers. things so factory-like. I'm thinking about all the export porcelains from China that everything looks exactly the same, that they, it, it, they, what they thrive for is a certain type of uniformity. Right. Uh, 
and also the painting factory that Winnie Wong talks about, that yes, they are personal touches, but ultimately when Walmart orders millions of sunflowers, Van Gogh sunflowers, they want everything that looks sort of like Van Gogh sunflowers. Yeah. I, wonder, like, I mean, the, so much of the anxiety that this, that the arts and crafts movement comes out of is, is a question of, of like numbers, right? Is just the, the mm -hmm. capability of producing so much so quickly and that craft has to do with um, with a slowness and a and a limited amount of of objects produced, mm. I don't know. If that and it is, and it was about the the person, right? The individual maker. I mean, that was it's the opposite of the industrial machine. It is about exactly. it's this sort of rooted in this in this valuation of the person. The worker has you know, that they're getting paid properly, that their work is valuable. I and mean, that's what William Morris right. writes about. That's what right. so much of this is grounded in. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and also, I mean, the experience of the maker, it's it's about that, like, the pleasure that that maker takes and the, like, and in whatever value terms we understand that, that sort of, like, joy of, of making. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which does feel like a through line to a lot of the kind of contemporary discussions around like DIY and self-care through yeah. stitching and, and whatever. We do a lot of that. I like self-care through stitching. That's good. I haven't heard <laughs> that one before. And I don't know. I, I guess I fetishize the hand too when I think about, yeah. about yep. making. Yeah. It, um, yeah. Because it seemed like this to me is me. I can feel... I can feel Clary Alien's where her fingers were in mm -hmm. the ripples of this. And I can tell that the way she made the handle is, is she's thinking about how fat my fingers are and how they're going to sit and how I'm going to hold it. And that's so different from the GW mug that I have. <laughs> Which I know. But the GW mug speaks more of you. No, it's, it's like <laughs> swag that I got when I got it. I know, but it speaks more about you than <laughs> this mug. Yeah. It speaks more about the artist, but the GW mug speaks more about the is <laughs> it's, it's propaganda. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is so fun. I this was is love great. doing this until Zoom kicks us off. I think my, my kids are back, so I'm going to have to run soon. But it is so good to see all of you. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was great. Discussion. Yeah. Thank you all for it. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, Diana, for sharing. Thanks this wonderful for inviting office. us. Yeah. Thank you. Happy birthday, William. Happy thank birthday, you. William. Thank, thank you. All right. Bye. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Stay healthy. Bye.